Good morning, Cornerstone. It is good to be here with you all. I'm sorry I couldn't uh, make it for the entire retreat. I look forward to it all year, talking back and forth with the elders and planning for it. But life happens, and we have to take it as it comes. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, in my absence, uh, I'm on some really good medication, feeling really nice right now. And so pray for me as I uh, bring this message. And pray for my wife, whose nerves are shattered because she had to drive down here with me as the co-pilot, which is always a terrible experience. So I had to repent before I get started. <laughs> yeah. I hope you all have had some good time resting and relaxing and refreshing yourselves with one another and in the presence of the Lord our God. I really enjoy retreats, the opportunity to walk and to look at nature and to see what God has done, what God is doing, and to quiet myself. Next year, we intend to uh, include a portion of quiet time uh, in the retreat, quiet time together in silence before the Lord, to clear our minds and our thoughts and our hearts, to hear what God may be saying for us in a new season of life. You all know that I'm a big believer in a contemplation and being quiet and studying the things of God in my heart. And I have long been, I've long had a deep interest in the divine human interaction between God and his prophets of old. I have studied vigorously most of the prophets' personalities to try to see and understand how God shaped each one of them individually to accomplish the mission that was before them. I have found no better example in all of Scripture than the life of Elijah, a life that was so full of insight. Elijah was a prophet who served God despite a series of psychological highs and lows. He was a very temperamental kind of person. It doesn't seem like Elijah was very friendly. He was a fiery prophet, and he was always under fire, always under pressure, always pushing the bar. Elijah had an intense zeal for his God, declaring himself in 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1 to be an emissary for God himself. That's what he lived for, to represent God to the people. He confronted Ahab, the king of Israel, predicted a long and devastating drought over the entire nation until they got God's house in order. He summoned 850 false prophets to Mount Carmel, for a prophetic showdown where he defeated 850 prophets, literally. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 2, Jezebel sends him a threat and promises that she will do the same thing to him that he had done to the false prophets before the day had ended. And when Elijah got this message, Elijah ran for his life. He had just defeated 850 false prophets and a woman sent him one threat. He jumped up and he ran for his life. That's where we find him in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 3 through 8, running to Beersheba. He had a servant that was with him, but he left his servant at Beersheba, and he went, the Bible says, another day's journey into the wilderness all alone and sat down under a broom tree. Elijah, this mighty man of God, has run for his life, and now he's sitting in the middle of the desert under a tree, which really looks like a bush. A broom tree looks like a bush. And had you asked Elijah five, what, what was his vision for five years in his life, what would it look like in the next four to five years? I'm sure he would not have envisioned himself sitting under a broom tree in the middle of the desert. I'm sure that wasn't the, the picture that he had in his mind for his future. But here he sits under a broom tree. In biblical terms, the broom tree symbolizes God's provision in our desolate places. A tree in the middle of the desert to give you shade from the sun. God's way of providing shade in the desert. And it's that, it still is a sign that God is with us. And that's a good thing for, for us to know, that God is with me. I'm sure Elijah was reminded of God's steadfastness during that season, sitting there under that tree. So content was he with the provisions of God that Elijah fell asleep. And while Elijah was sleeping, God sent an angel to prepare breakfast for him and to give him some water. God was with him. And after the angel prepared the food for him, he awakened Elijah to eat. The Bible says Elijah ate and drank, and after he ate and drank, he lay down again. So the angel returned a second time, fed Elijah again. But this wasn't the first time in Elijah's life that God had provided for him, for his material well-being through outside agents. You recall the story of the widow, the widow of Zarephath in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 24. God sent Elijah to this widow for provision because the drought had caused a famine in the land. And God told Elijah, I want you to get up and go to see the widow in Zarephath. And she's going to provide for you for the duration of this famine. But in that particular instance, the widow didn't reach out to Elijah like the angel did. The widow didn't reach out and offer him bread and water. In this case, Elijah has to go 
and ask her for provision. He didn't have to ask the angel for anything. The angel just did it for him, but he had to go now and ask her for provision. And if we consider for a moment the nomadic, the independent life of Elijah, we can imagine that this encounter with the widow had to be a little awkward. And when you read the story, the account in 1 Kings chapter 17, your suspicion is immediately con confirmed. God sends Elijah to this widow in Zarephath and explains to him that the widow is going to provide for him for a season. Well, Elijah sees the woman gathering sticks as he enters the town. And this is what he does. He shouts to her, please get me a little water in a cup so that I may drink. He doesn't say, hello, my name is Elijah and I have a request of you know. He doesn't say, hi, I'm Elijah. God told me that you're going to provide for me for the... No, he doesn't explain anything. Just, hey, get me some water. I'm thirsty. Then as she turns to go ahead and get him some water to fulfill his request, Elijah calls out again, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. Fetch me some vittles. I don't even know you, never met you. You don't know me. Get me some water and some bread. Thanks. This man who can call down fire from heaven, this great man of God who can persuade God to close heaven so that it does not rain, this child of God who wields so much influence in heavenly places has absolutely no charm in a single bone in his body. He is off-putting. He comes across as if he's entitled. He doesn't seem to have the right chemistry for building strong and lasting interpersonal relationships. He doesn't have much practice or experience in developing strong bonds with other people. Even though he has mastered, possibly better than most, the art and the discipline of, thri of thriving with the divine. He doesn't understand people. And so this widow responds to him honestly, and she says that she doesn't have enough food for herself and her own son, so she has no food for Elijah. And without a shadow of a doubt, the woman is telling Elijah the truth. She doesn't have enough food. But I have to also wonder if Elijah's presentation also caused her to not want to share the little bit that she had with him. Had Elijah been more approachable, had Elijah been more humble, maybe a little more friendly, I wonder if she wouldn't have tried to figure out a way they could help one another. After all, Elijah is a man. Elijah is strong. He probably can hunt and get her some more food. He'd probably be a better negotiator with the other men in the community to tie them over until the famine lifted. She wasn't even thinking along those lines. None of that crossed her mind. She doesn't view Elijah as the kind of person that she wants to be associated with. A prophet of God. I have no, no food, sir, so take your water and move along. And in that moment, hearing her story, Elijah becomes more keenly aware that he is not the only one in need of provision. That the world does not just consist of he and God, but of other people. But how could he have missed that? He's the one who shut up heaven. He's the one who initiated the famine. And he goes to this woman casually and asks her for food, knowing that he is the one who caused the famine in the first place. How does he even expect her to have any food? How had he not already counted the cost and the toll that this drought would have upon all the inhabitants? Well, I'll tell you how. and I can understand it. Elijah is on mission. Elijah is zealous for God alone, recognizing that if he can help other people become just as zealous as he is, he is their lives will be far better than anything they could ever imagine. His heart is in the right place, but his eyes are only on God and no one else. Not the people around him, not the husbandless woman God sent him to. For Elijah, this widow is merely a provision from God, a resource to get him on his evangelistic way. He doesn't dislike her. He doesn't even know her. But the problem is that Elijah doesn't take the time to even get to know her. He only wants to know God. And while the widow is worried about how to feed her small family, Elijah knows something that the widow doesn't know. Elijah knows God's plan. And he explains to her, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The bowl of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil become empty until the day that the Lord provides rain on the face of the earth. You're going to be fine. You can feed me and you and your son and myself. We're going to have more than enough throughout the days of this famine. Don't worry. Okay, that's good to know, but why didn't you lead off with that, Elijah? Why did you say that in the first place? Why did he come to her making requests she was likely not able to fulfill instead of bringing this good news? Because Elijah, like so many believers, doesn't understand people very well. He hasn't spent much time getting to know them, rubbing shoulders with them on a personal level. He's been busy serving God. And as ironic as it may sound, this is often the reason believers tend to walk with God all alone and not seek out fellowship. Why? For the sake of efficiency. 
there are only so many hours in a day. And a person has to measure out their time as efficiently as possible in order to do all that they believe God is calling them to do. We are jealous for our personal time, defensive of our emotional spaces, and protective of our boundaries. All for the sake of being efficient in this thing called life. And I'm not talking about the spiritual life, just life in general. Now, when we incorporate the spiritual life of the believer into this equation, there is the tendency to feel like there is no more time left to do all that we're required to do for God and our personal lives and to foster or develop new, deep spiritual relationships with others. That's how it feels. And this is not an unfounded fear. No, it's not. In fact, Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 32 through 34, that for this very reason, it is better for believers to remain unmarried because he says one who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord how he may please the Lord but one who is married is concerned about the things of the world how he may please his wife or her, or her husband and his interests Paul says his interests are divided Paul's argument there is that people take time people take energy people take focus and that is time and energy and focus that one could use devoted to the Lord I am sure that Elijah would, would have agreed summarily with Paul's assessment here. I am sure he didn't really feel like getting acquainted with that widow and wished that God would have just sent an angel like he did in chapter 19. People take time and energy and focus, and that's a fact. Where there are relationships, there will always be conflict, and conflict can make the spiritual journey quite inefficient. This is the reason that many believers do not seek out fellowship for the sake of efficiency. And with that, I want to share with us one of the surest ways to foster closeness and lasting bonds amongst other believers within the body, within this church and within the body. This is one of the best kept secrets to fostering healthy spiritual relationships that one can practice. And it is the practice of humility. Humble people take up the least amount of space in other people's lives. By this, I mean that humble people are more accommodating than entitled. Humble people are more sensitive to other people's limitations as they view others more highly than themselves. And because of this, humble people tend to never overstay their welcome and to never dig more deeply into another person's life than is appropriate. Humble people. And this gives people who are zealous for God, like Elijah, a sense of safety in assuming that you're not going to invade their lives and take up all of their spiritual oxygen. If you want to foster a healthy spiritual relationship with others, be humble. Proud people, people who view themselves and their opinions as the center of the universe, proud people are a threat to people who are zealous for God. Because a relationship with a person like this will make the spiritual quest so much less efficient. Hold your place for a minute there. Because I know that some of us right now are sitting at the edge of our seats thinking to ourselves, but wait a minute, Pastor, the, the Christian life is all about people. It's all about others. How can you say that relationships make the spiritual life less efficient? I'm glad you asked that question. To that question, I respond that while the Christian life is about people, the Christian life is not all about people. The Christian life is about people, but the Christian life is not all about people. The Christian life is all about Jesus. Jesus is all about people. And the only way we can properly and appropriately serve others is if we adequately and effectively engage with Jesus Christ, which takes time and energy and focus. And the time and energy and focus we have left, we can allocate to our lives and our families and to others. This means that we have to be selective as to the kinds of people we expend our time with. And the person who is humble is always at the top of the list because we know that they won't take up too much space. How much space do you take up in other people's lives? How imposing are you in other people's lives? Backbiters and gossips are a threat to spiritual efficiency. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 19, Solomon instructs us that a gossip betrays a confidence. So he says, avoid a gossip who talks too much. Paul said, avoid those kinds of people. Of course, he's not talking about over-talkative people. He's talking about people who talk about things they should not talk about. He's talking about people who talk about things that are beyond their knowledge. These kinds of people drain you of your spiritual vitality. Solomon says, avoid those kinds of people. They'll make your spiritual journey inefficient. This only applies, this only applies to those who are not in desperate need, of course. 
People who are in true, desperate need can always find an audience with those who are zealous for God. The spiritually mature believer lives to serve people who are in need. I was on a mini vacation last week. Thank you, Mike Seth, for filling the pulpit for me. Thank you, elders, for overseeing this weekend. I was on a mini vacation last weekend in Kentucky. Wonderful spirit, uh, family experience with my brothers. I haven't seen some of them in years. We had a really good time. And while I was on vacation, I said, you know, I'm getting myself some me time. I don't take out enough time for myself. I'm getting myself some, some me time. And God decided to interrupt my plans. I was driving into a national park in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. I saw a man sitting alone beside his car in one of those little uh, patio chairs. And I perceived the look on his face to be a look of desperation. I drove past him. We drove through the park, and I was headed for the exit after about 15 minutes. And as we approached the exit, the same man was sitting there. Now he had his head laying flat on the picnic bench. And in that moment, as far as I was concerned, my me time was officially over. And whatever this man needed, no matter how much time it took, whether a few hours or a few days, I was all in and completely devoted to seeing him experience whatever relief it was that he needed. My entire focus shifted from vacation and, and me time to what does he need. Spiritually mature believers are always able, always ready to serve. The heart of the believer should always be prepared to serve those who are in need, no matter what might be going on in our own personal lives. Because the power and the strength to serve people like these does not subtract from our personal energy, does not subtract from our spiritual focus. Because the Holy Spirit serves those kinds of people through us. And all we have to do is take time. And comparing spiritual things to spiritual things, it is safe to say that time is the least valued commodity in all of heaven. Time is the least relevant commodity in all of heaven. And energy and focus are of much greater consequence. And the Holy Spirit provides us that energy and that focus to serve other people, always. But the Holy Spirit does not provide much assistance to accommodate people who are self-centered and self-indulged. So that the time you spend catering to these kinds of people is actually time and energy and focus lost. Elijah wouldn't know much about that. Because Elijah is so isolated from the self-centered and from the destitute alike. He is isolated from everybody. It's as if he views relationships, human relationships, as a waste of daylight, as a waste of his time. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 8, after he's taken his second rest, he decides to isolate himself from people even more. The text says, Elijah arose and ate and drank, and he journeyed in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. He is exhausted, seeking personal isolation and relief from his painful emotions. Mount Horeb in the Bible re represents or symbolizes desolation, barrenness, and solitude. Elijah is, is only the, the second person in the Bible, the first person in the Bible actually, to return to Mount Horeb after Moses received the Ten Commandments there. So he knows he's not going to run into any Israelites in this desolate place. He wants to get as far away from his people as possible. He wants to be in a place where he doesn't have to deal with his fellow Israelites, a place where he could just sit by himself and be himself, just he and God. Elijah isn't just running from Jezebel. Elijah is running away from life itself. He is running away from life because he is running away from people. You know it, relationships, what gives our lives color and meaning and vitality. Strong, healthy, spiritual relationships with other believers give our lives purpose. But if Elijah is determined to run away from relationships, and if he sets up shop in this desolate mountain all by himself, eventually Elijah is going to succumb to that emptiness and anxiety that haunts the psyche of all of those who choose to do life all alone and not side by side. Again, this is where you find him, at Mount Horeb, at Mount Desolation, at Mount Isolation and Solitude. And God meets him there and God asks him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you here for? Why are you out here in the middle of the wilderness all alone, away from humanity? What are you trying to accomplish? And Elijah's answer, in my opinion, truly gets to the heart of why so many believers choose to walk with God alone and maintain only formal but loving relationships with other believers. Listen to what he says. He says, the first reason I am here is because I have been very zealous for the Lord. I have been hyper-focused. I have been hyper-fixated on accomplishing your will. I was never able to find that healthy balance between life with God and life with others. That's why I'm here. I am here alone because I don't have many people who can understand me or appreciate me because of my eccentric manner, my style of living. I am here alone 
because I have been very zealous for the Lord and I forgot to take interest in other people's lives. That's why I'm here. Maybe if Eliza would have taken out the time to build strong relationship with people. Maybe Jezebel wouldn't have been so quick to threaten him because he would have had a support system. He would have had a political and religious support system, but he didn't know anybody. Jezebel could threaten his life because he didn't have anyone in his corner that he could count on. No one to defend him. Of all the people who were present that day when he called down fire from heaven, of all the spectators who were so excited to hear from God through Elijah, Elijah didn't take the time to get to know any of them. That's why he's here, isolated and in despair. Of course, it is most important to be zealous for God, but it is also important to recognize the value that the body of Christ can add to each of our lives. We are better when we are side by side. I am here because I've been zealous for God. I've been hyper-focused and hyper-fixated. The second reason Elijah says he's here in this desolate place is because God's people suck. Wait, 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 that's not what he said. What did he actually say? Here's what he said. The sons of Israel have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the... Well, I guess that is what he said. Your people suck. That's what I'm doing here, hiding from your people. And this is something I hear from the unchurched all the time. That the people of God are too judgmental, too tribal, too hypocritical, too biased, too hateful. And I'm not talking about people in the world complaining about us. Because truthfully, sometimes people in the world have extra biblical expectations that none of us are obliged to accommodate. I'm not talking about people in the world. I'm talking about people who have been a part of the church, some born and raised in the church, just walking away from the church, claiming that the church is unloving and unwelcoming with self-appointed cliques and elites who think it within their authority to direct other people's lives and affairs, power brokers and backstabbers and liars, hypocrites. I hear that often. From people who believe in Jesus Christ, from people who, who for, all, for all intents and purposes, from people who are following Jesus Christ, just disenchanted with his people. That's what Elijah's complaining about. He's given up on God's people. You don't have to raise your hand, but just be honest with yourself. Have you ever given up on God's people and just thought, you know what? I can do bad by myself, the extra drama. Have you ever thought that? You don't have to raise your hand, but I'm sure there are people in this room who have given up. There are people who come to church every Sunday who have given up on church people. They come in at the beginning of service and they sit there, and before second hour can start, before anybody can do any kind of meals, you don't see them anymore. They love God, and they love the assembly, they love the worship, but they really don't like God's people because of distrust, because of wounds, because of things that happen in churches. We don't want to be that kind of church where people leave our presence wounded like Elijah is here. Elijah is wounded, and some of us harbor a similar sentiment. And this is one of the reasons sometimes believers remain aloof from other believers, even though we worship together every Sunday. But this is not something that can be corrected. This is not something that needs to be corrected. This is something that has to be demonstrated to the wounded believer, that this is a safe place where conflict and confusion is quickly resolved. That has to be proven. Trust has to be earned, even among believers. Elijah doesn't feel safe around God's people because they have proven to be false and he thinks they hate him. And some of Elijah's assessment is certainly correct, but some of it is just Elijah's imagination. Because as you read his whole life story, his whole ministry story, you never actually see him reaching out to anyone besides the, the widow. He doesn't reach out to anyone. He doesn't build any relationship. He doesn't have any friend. He really doesn't know God's people very well. But anyway, that's why he's here, because he's been jealous for God. He has been hyper-focused and hyper-fixed on doing God's will. He's here because God's people are not serious about him as far as he's concerned. And lastly, Elijah says he is in this isolated place because I alone am left. This is real problem. He doesn't know it. I alone am left. How long has Elijah felt this way, like he was alone in the world? How long has he felt this bitter cold? If we go back to the beginning of his ministry, was there ever a time in scripture when Elijah wasn't alone? He was always alone. God sent him to the widow for a couple years, but that is the only relationship Elijah ever seemed to maintain. Elijah has been alone and as far as he can tell for all of his ministry life. He has never connected with God's people on the deeper, more personal level. He has been in his own mind for too long and he has neglected building relationships. This is why he is at Mount Horeb alone, because of his inability to get out of his own head and invest his life into others. That's why he's there all alone. That's why you're there all alone.
because of an inability to get out of your own mind and invest your life in other people. That's why. And we know this is true because Elijah didn't even realize what he's going to learn in two more verses, that God has 7,000 more people who are just as zealous for God as Elijah is. And he doesn't even know them. He never even met them. He have never spoken to them, didn't even know they existed. He really thought that he was all alone in the world, the only one zealous about God. He's mistaken. He thinks himself to be unique. He thinks his problems to be unique and special. He thinks that no one can understand him. She thinks that no one can understand her. And I have to say it, your struggles are much more bitter, much more difficult, and much more painful when you think that you are the only one. When you think that your situation is unique, that is the most painful feeling. Has anybody ever felt that? Like no one in the whole world can understand me. That is a scary place to be. But had he been reaching out to the people of God, he would have known there are other people who have experienced this too. I'm not the only one. I'm not by myself. I'm not alone. You're not alone. When you're feeling troubled and dismayed and distraught, you should pick up the phone and call one of your brothers and sisters in Christ. You shouldn't suffer alone. It's not good for you. It's not healthy for you. We should reach out to one another more, share our burdens with one another, to be open and honest with one another and transparent with one another. Don't be a believer who sits at home and suffers in silence when all of this resource is available to you. Don't be like Elijah in this instance. He's a great man of God, can't take anything away from him. But don't be like him in this particular instance. Reach out to somebody. All the while, God knew that Elijah had relational challenges. All the while, God knew this. He could tell. I sent you to the widow, man. You go talk about, give me some water, give me some vittles. What's wrong with you? God could tell. <laughs> he wasn't a people kind of person. Some of us just aren't. I'll say it this way, he wasn't very likable. Eliza wasn't likable. She would have had a hard time making friends with people. And there are Christians who are like that. There are Christians who are just not likable people. You know some. <laughs> we all know some. Some people are just not likable. How do you get along with people who are not likable? How do you make yourself available even to people who are unlikable? You walk past Elijah, Elijah sitting there all isolated, always mumbling something to himself, never looks up at you, never acknowledges you, and you just walk on past Elijah. How you doing, sister? How you doing, brother? Yeah, right there is strange. Eh? And that guy's a prophet of God who can call on fire from heaven and then shut up heaven. Yeah, he's not likable, but he has what you need. Sometimes God puts the peep, puts the thing that you need in some of the most unlikable people. It's just true. <laughs> It's true. Sometimes the very gift, the treasure that you need in your life, the believer who has it, you don't like them because you never got to know them, because you never opened up to them, because you never tried to like them. But that's how God does things. If we believe the scriptures, the book of Isaiah, Jesus was one of the most unlikable per people you could have met. He has no form that you would want to even look at him. He's not the kind of person you'd want to even have a relationship with. God put the greatest gift of humanity in an unlikable person. Mm. And the answer that you need is probably in the person that you refuse to commune with. And in order to get what God has for you, you have to humble yourself. Be willing to be inconvenienced with the discomfort of sitting with someone who you may not really enjoy. Huh? That's God's way. God knew that Elijah had relational issues and deficiencies. And God already knows what Elijah needs. And maybe that's why God sent Elijah to the widow in the first place, was to teach him how to build a relationship, to give him some relational training. But God knows what he needs already, and he gives him this, this, this answer, this solution to his dilemma. In verse 15 of 1 Kings chapter 19, he says this, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael king over Aram. You shall anoint Jehu the son of Nimshi king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, as prophet in your place. He doesn't mention the fact that people are trying to kill Elijah. He doesn't mention the fact that they've killed the prophet. He doesn't mention any of that. He says, look, go and anoint this person king, anoint this person king over there, and finally anoint, uh, anoint Elisha to be the prophet in your place. Most of God's instruction to Elijah here is pretty much political and strategic, easily done. But there is one aspect of this, these instructions that we see really rubbed Elijah the wrong way. You shall anoint Elisha as prophet in your place. God offers Elijah no comforting words, no fear not, no do not fear, I will be with you, no. What he tells Elijah is, Elijah, you need a friend. You've come all the way out here to this desolate place looking for me. I was always with you. What you really need, Elijah, is some human interaction. Go and find Elisha and get yourself a friend. You need someone to talk to. You need someone to share your life and your experiences with. You need an Elisha in your life. 
Elijah is not so concerned about God's prophetic succession plan. He knows he has to die one day, or at least he thought he was going to die one day. That didn't bother him. What bothered Elijah is that in order for Elisha to become the prophet in his place, Elijah was going to have to spend a whole lot of time and a whole lot of energy and a whole lot of focus on Elisha. He was going to have to build a relationship. Go get yourself a friend. Stop sitting around here all by yourself, looking up to heaven all the time. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, but love your neighbor as yourself. Go get yourself a neighbor, Elijah. We can tell it bothered Elijah by the way he went to introduce himself to Elisha. The Bible says, verse 19, he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. And Elijah came over to Elisha and threw his cloak on him. Didn't say a word to the boy. Threw something at him and walked off. No, no, we know in scripture that means, you know, you're giving him the, the cloak, the anointing. But he didn't say anything to this guy. He just walked over. <laughs> there he is. Right there. That's what he did. He threw something at him and walked away. Then Elisha, realizing what this symbol meant, Elisha left the oxen behind and ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my mother and my father. Then I'll follow you. And listen to Elijah's response. Go back for what have I done to you? Get out of here. He has a problem with this. He has a problem with this. No, man. What have I done to you? Go away. Shoot. I'm focused on God, on the holy, on the heavenly of heavenlies. I don't have time for you. Just not in those runt. I don't even like you. Go back. I'm a nomad. I don't have time for this. He intentionally tried to dissuade Elisha from following him. He wanted to be left alone. So Elisha, the Bible says in verse 21, Elisha returned from following him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and cooked the meat with the implements of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he got up, Elisha got up and he followed Elijah and served him. I imagine for the first few weeks, it was really hard to like Elijah. Getting up in the middle of the night, leaving without telling me he's gone. I got to jump up. Where, where, where Elijah go? I got to find Elijah. I'm sure he treated his kid kind of bad. He didn't want him around. He wanted to be left alone. Just him and God. Just him and God. But there comes a time in your life that God begins to show you, listen, I, I enjoy the fact that you enjoy sitting with me so much. I enjoy the fact that you love praying so much. I enjoy the fact you love your devotion so much. That's really good, Calvin. But man, you need a friend. You need a human to go talk to. Talking to me all the time is, is okay, but you really need to talk to some people. You need a friend. You need some fellowship. That's all a lot of us need is some fellowship. A lot of our struggles, a lot of our, our troubles would go away if we would just befriend somebody and not try to walk in this world alone. I was reading an article about uh, young, young men and women in Asia. One million young people have locked themselves in their houses, refusing to connect with society ever again. Just lock themselves away. The world is becoming so isolated. We're all together, but we're so apart. And I know that we all have busy lives and things going on in our personal lives. But it doesn't take much time and energy and focus to pick up the phone and talk to someone for eight minutes just to see how you're doing. Nothing else. Not trying to pry into anybody's personal business. Not trying to become a life teller where I'm telling people how to live. This is why, this is why a lot of Christians stay away from one another. When you become a life teller and start telling people how to live their life, how to do their thing, people don't enjoy that. We're all adults. Once that starts happening, people start cutting themselves off. Like, no, I don't know. I can't be bothered with that. I can't be bothered with that. And after a while, there's nobody left. You're all alone. But if we each practice humility, and not be imposing on one another, but just loving one another and open to one another. A lot of the problems we experience in our lives will go away. Elijah doesn't realize that yet, but after, by the time he gets ready to leave, caught up in the chariot going to heaven, he realizes Elisha was the best thing that could have ever happened to him. Getting a friend was probably the best thing that could have happened to him. Elijah returned from following him and took the pair of oxen, sacrificed them, cooked them, and he went running, chasing after Elijah. And that's the final point, that building a relationship with some people requires diligence and patience. And just because a person seems closed off to you doesn't mean they don't need you in their lives. Some people just have different temperaments. Some people are much more slow to trust, and we should be patient with them. A temperament like Elisha's temperament would throw off most people today. He would seem cold and callous. He wasn't personable. He wasn't very approachable. But I hope for each of us, this time away has given us the opportunity to open ourselves to one another, to open ourselves to someone in the church we've never talked to before, to get to know your brothers and sisters in Christ, an opportunity to build relationships with one another. And I hope that you can see the benefits of strong relationships in your good days, because God knows it's true. When the bad days come, you want to be able to pick up the phone and speak to someone who knows you intimately and directly. There is nothing worse in the Christian life than to be caught out in the storm all alone. 
we should prioritize healthy relationships with one another, not just programs and projects, not just building a church, but in building strong, lasting bonds that will last for a lifetime. And by this, the world will know that we are Christ's disciples if we have love for one another. Father God, I thank you for this church, for this body of believers who covenant together to serve you, to know you, to love and to serve one another and to serve this world together. We pray, Lord God, that no one here ever walks alone. I pray right now that no one here feels lonely, but that we are interconnected and interdependent one upon another, that there are people within this body that we can trust to maintain our confidentiality, to be our support, to give us the love that we need in order to mend. Thank you for this family. Thank you for this body. Thank you for this time away together. I pray, Lord God, that it's been special and meaningful and insightful to each person. Thank you for the leadership who put this together. Thank you, God, for growing us closer and closer together as a family. For the unity that is among us, for the unity that is being developed among us, we give you praise. Bind our lives together by your Holy Spirit. Secure our relationships in the bond of your peace. Bless us with the spiritual gift of humility. Teach us how to love one another, how to get along with one another. Lord God, for those who came out to this retreat praying for revival and for renewal, I pray that if you haven't already, that you would meet them here today, that you would heal broken hearts, that you would mend wounds, that you'd help us, Lord God, to find resolution to our past traumas and our past troubles, that you'd give us clarity of thought and new insight to what your will is for each of our lives, for your glory and in your name. Amen.